Hare Krishna. So today morning we are discussing Brahma's instructions to Prithu Maharaj. And he is requesting that he, Prithu Maharaj, remember the purpose of his descent and act accordingly. So the context here, I will speak on this theme of how our purpose can help us to overcome our circumstantial emotions. Broadly, so look at, let's look at the context here. What has happened is Prithu Maharaj is performing a yajna and Indra has come in various guises to try to disrupt the yajna. And while trying to disrupt the yajna in this way, Indra, after Prithu tries to stop him, Indra starts taking various garbs to come and then disappear and those garbs are what are later on taken on by others and thus various upadharmas, various uh, false systems of religion are going to be created. So Brahmaji is telling stop this. Now if we consider from a very you could say legislative or judicial um, or argumentative perspective, we could say the point over the troublemaker here is Indra. And Prithu is just doing his duty. He is, he is a Kshatriya and Kshatriyas are expected to perform Yajnas. And he is a heroic Kshatriya. And if he has the capacity to perform a hundred sacrifices, that's his glory. That's his privilege. He's not stealing from anyone to do that. So it's his, his privilege. It's his, he's doing simply his dharma. And if he's doing it in a glorious way, nobody should have any problem with it. So here he could say that very well, Indra is the troublemaker. And he could interpret this instruction to mean stop these all false uh, forms of religious system from originating he could say that this means that I should kill Indra. Because Indra is the troublemaker. But that is not Brahmaji's intention. Brahmaji's intention is that you should stop doing these sacrifices. So that Indra will stop disrupting. And then all these other forms of religion will not come. So, so there might be something which is contextually right. In this particular argument, I am right and you are wrong. And we might devote ours, we might put all our energy in trying to prove this. And sometimes the other person just doesn't accept it. Some people are such that even if we prove with all possible argumentation to them that they are wrong, what happens is a person convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. They just don't change. And Krishna, here Brahmaji is telling and eventually Vishnu will also come and appreciate Prithu that you know, don't be like two squabbling children. Be the adult in the room. If a child is squabbling, the adults can't start squabbling with the child. So it says Indra, because of his attachment, has become like a child now. Indra is attached to his position. He is the king of the heavens and he is feeling insecure that if Prithu performs a hundred sacrifices, Prithu will become entitled to get the post of Indra. And therefore, he doesn't want Indra to do the hundred sacrifice. And so generally what happens is, it is, there is, there is biological immaturity that is there because we may be physically small. But there is psychological immaturity that comes because our vision is small. If we are too attached to small things, that leads to psychological immaturity. Psychological immaturity means what? We make a big hue and cry over small things. And sometimes if we look back at even big world wars that start, they start sometimes over small differences. 
and one difference leads to another to another and they escalate and eventually it becomes like a fireball that destroys millions of people so when when we are somebody psychologically immature that means they're too attached to something which is not that big which is small but it attachment can make small things seem very big and detachment can make even big things seem small so life determines the events but we determine the emotional impact of those events on us so krishna so here pluto is being told that be an adult in life and the way in way to stop this is not by killing indra indra is a celestial being indra is the king of the gods and killing him would disrupt the universal order and but brahma is telling you just let go of the desire for the hundred sacrifices now in every area of life there are certain achievements that are considered to be like landmarks say if in if a sport like cricket and if a player scores 100 runs that's called a century and a batsman who gets out on 99 is considered oh you're so unfortunate you couldn't get to a century if you get to a century that's a landmark and we all would like to achieve landmarks so in a in a sense a landmark is a mark on the land so when we achieve a landmark that means we can show the world it. this is what i have achieved so i remember in in many uh, maybe 28 25 years ago when i used to follow cricket in india one of india's most famous cricketers he was on 196 or 97 and he was on 190 or something like that and the captain at that time declared the innings and this cricketer got so upset that for months although they were in the same team he refused to talk with the captain and the captain had to communicate with this cricketer through the vice captain and he said i could just have just a few more minutes i could have scored a double century Said, no, actually, we wanted to get the other team out, and we didn't have time for the bowlers. So anyway, just didn't listen. So what happens is, when people come close to landmarks, at that time their emotions get very strongly invested in it, and then they often don't maybe think of the big picture. So detachment is not apathy. Ap- ap- apathy. Detachment is not lack of caring. Detachment means. we don't get so consumed by the immediate as to forget about the ultimate so here prajapate the word used to describe pluto is that actually you are meant to protect dharma prajapati literally means one who is the progenitor of humanity the word pati can mean pati is husband pati also means the progenitor it can also be protector so pluto is not literally a progenitor he is not like daksha or others who who gives rise to many living beings but he also is a protector so he says is you are a protector and you act to protect dharma you act to protect dharma means if you do what is required for making sure that things don't become worse and in this case what is required is just let go sometimes the the right resolution of a political issue is necessary for pursuing our purpose but sometimes the right resolution of a political issue may not be necessary if you want to move towards a, our purpose say for example if we are going on a road and somebody suddenly cuts across us and then we get angry with them we say how dare you cut like this and if that person argues actually i didn't cut you cut across me no but i was on the straight lane you entered into the lane no but you should have looked at me now we might say that they are wrong and we are right but suppose we have to go for an important meeting we have to reach on time and we spend uh, half an hour an hour arguing with that person then what is happening even if we win that argument what is going to happen we will be late for a bigger meeting so at that time just let it go let it go so it's not necessary for us to uh, to win every argument in fact one test of love see love is a very easy word to speak but love is often tested through actions 
And, and love means, one way of assessing love is love raises us above our ego's need to be right at all times. Our ego has a need to prove I am right and you are wrong. And that need, now sometimes for the resolution of the issue, for the overall overall project or the overall purpose of what we want to do, things have to be done in a particular way. And then we may have to stand for. But at other times, some things are not that consequential. So just let go. So in small issues, if we try to prove that I am right and you are wrong, then the end result of that is we may be right, we may prove ourselves right in that particular situation, but we lose track of our purpose. And the end result becomes like the winning the battle and losing the war. As opposed to two forces of fighting. And there's one, one very resilient contingent of the opposite side over here. And if they're defending our army, just concentrates all their attack over here. And they start fighting with all their energy over there. And they win, they defeat that contingent, contingent, but the other remaining contingent attacks from the other side and destroys the fort. So they win the battle, but lose the war. So for us, our mind often makes us trip and trip and fall in this way. Trip, it, it trips us and it traps us. How? One way the mind can allure us, the forces of illusion can, can captivate us is by direct temptations. It could be lust, it could be greed, it could be such desires. This directly drag us away from Krishna. And when temptations come in such a direct way, we understand. Okay, this is something which I should not be doing. But, so it's like we are, we are supposed to be doing a duty and we get allured by pleasure and we go away. That's almost like a deserter or a betrayer. And most of us would not succumb to that gross a temptation. But another, if, if you consider war is going on, if a soldier is bribed and told to quit, just give, give up. That's, that's outrageous. But another way the opponent can actually make the, make the soldier ineffective is by getting the soldier caught in small battles while the big battle is lost. And this is what the forces of illusion often do. This is Kali Yuga, and Kali Yuga is called the age of Kalaha. Kalaha is quarrel. Quarrel means that how does Kali induce quarrels? In many different ways. But one way is by making us lose perspective of things. With small things, we make them very big. And sometimes people remember, you know, 25 years ago when I did this, you spoke this to me. 25 years ago. Come on, grow up now. Let go of the wounds. You say, no, but I'm hurt. Okay, you're hurt. But so many things may have hurt us too. 25. This doesn't mean that if somebody's a routine abuser and they need to be let all scot free. But the nature of the world is that somehow we all hurt each other. We do, I do something which will hurt you. You will do something which will hurt me. That's how we all are. We are all struggling uh, struggling souls, we all have our conditionings and the forces of illusion often catch us by, they capture us, they captivate us, they defeat us by making us small, fight small battles while we lose the big battle. So this is what we see quite often, that the important thing is not just to be right in that particular argument. It is to be right in pursuing our ultimate purpose. So we could say this is the right beyond the right. Circumstantially, I am right and you are wrong. And I can put all my energy to proving that. But then, are we moving in the right direction? Are we striving to fulfill our mission? We sing in the Mangalati, Samsara, Dhawan, only the Loka. That there is a forest fire of material existence. And uh, the spiritual master's mercy is meant to extinguish that forest fire. Uh, as I travel across the world, meet devotees in various parts of the world, I find
find that most, not most, but a large part of our, the energy of the devotee community goes not in extinguishing the forest fires of material existence, it is extinguishing the fires that devotees themselves have lit. <laughs> So we spend so much of our energy in trying to resolve our own conflicts. Now at one level, conflicts are unavoidable because we are all individuals. And especially if somebody wants to practice Krishna consciousness, they have to go against the void. And it requires courage. It requires at one level a strong mind to go against the current of the world and to start practicing Krishna consciousness. And when such strong-minded individuals they start practicing something and within the practice of Krishna consciousness, they develop certain opinions. This is how things should be done. It is difficult for strong-minded individuals to actually let go of their opinions. There are attachments in different modes. In the mode of ignorance, the attachment is just to not taking any responsibility. Just be lazy, just be comfortable. People, uh, people in the people, people. There are some people who make things, and there are other people who make excuses. And people in the mode of ignorance are expert in making excuses so that they don't have to do anything. That is their attachment. Now, people in the mode of passion, their attachment is to things. People in the mode of goodness, often their attachment is to opinions. It's subtle. The things are subtler. In goodness, I have to prove that I am right. And that's why it is just, this is Nasa Urshe Yasse Matam Bhinnam. That every sage will have one's own opinion. In fact, it is said about philosophers or even scientists. If there are six scientists in a room, there will be seven opinions. <laughs> and they all vehemently quarrel over those opinions. So what happens is that we all have our particular attachments. It could be, it could be with the, the differences could be with respect to practical things. Or should this, or should this, should this festival be conducted this way or that? It could be over philosophical issues. Is this, is this philosophical point like this or it is like this? I saw one one picture which one devotee had made. It is like two Roman warriors. They are fighting against each other and they are using uh, axes, axe-like objects. <laughs> both of them are hitting each other. And in the front of the axes, both the axes are Prabhupada said. <laughs> so both of them are having quotes of Prabhupada. They say, Prabhupada said this. No, Prabhupada said this. And you can fight over that. So what happens is that ultimately Prabhupada was a living and resourceful person. So Prabhupada spoke according to what was most effective for, for furthering Krishna consciousness in the situation he was in. And the particular context, something so there, there are so many, if you look at Prabhupada's words, there are so many places where we might see apparent contradictions. So later by Prabhupada, some, some Brahmachari writes to Prabhupada, and apparently has some problem with um, some desires. And Prabhupada said, it's my standing instruction to all my disciples that if they have any problem with controlling their desires, they should get married. And in another letter, where Prabhupada said, since you are troubled by desire, everyone is troubled by desire. Even Brahmaji is troubled by desire. If you think that simply getting married is a solution of for your desires, you are an illusion. Just tolerate it. Two opposite things. Now, if we consider, probably there's a context. Maybe this devotee has been writing several times to Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said, okay, you tried, it's not working, fine, move on. But in this case, Prabhupada said, no, you, you tolerate it. So like that, Prabhupada gave so many, if you look at Prabhupada's books carefully, there are so many places where Prabhupada will give specific instructions. In the Krishna, in the Bhagavad Gita itself, one place Prabhupada says, we should not worship any form other than Krishna. So it's not even the form of Vishnu. And yet Prabhupada in his own temples had the forms of Ram established. We have it in Washington, we have Ram in Juhu. So 
is what Prabhupada did and what Prabhupada spoke. Are they different? No, Prabhupada, in that particular purport of the Bhagavad Gita, is actually manifesting the mood of the gopis in Vrindavan. Then we know that famous pastime when in the Rasa Krishna had disappeared. The gopis were frantically searching for Krishna. And then Krishna, just to have fun with the gopis, manifested a form as Vishnu. And in complexion, Vishnu and Krishna are somewhat alike. So the gopis were delighted. Oh, Krishna is there. And they ran towards what they thought was Krishna. And then they saw him, Vishnu. And they were disappointed. For the sages, the sight of Vishnu is the, size, is the cause of the greatest celebration. For the gopis, it is the cause of heartbreaking disappointment to see Vishnu. And then they offer obeisances and then they say, Oh Vishnu, please can you tell me where is Krishna? Now their love was so intense that sometimes we put on a mask but we are not able to maintain that mask. So what happens? Krishna chose not to speak. Krishna just pointed like this. Till the gopis ran. And the last one of the gopis who came was Radharani. And Radharani asked, Oh Vishnu, have you seen Krishna? She was calling out with such fervency that Krishna tried to point his hands the same way. But because of Radharani's devotion, Krishna's two hands melted. And Radharani saw the beloved Lord of her heart in front of her. So Prabhupada is writing in that mood. That the gopis do not want to worship even Krishna. It's not even Vishnu. They want to worship only Krishna. Now, is that an absolute injunction for all temples for all times to come? Not necessarily. So context is extremely important for comprehending text. There is text and there is context. Text is what is said and context is where is it said, why is it said, when is it said. So quite often there are literalists. Literalist means there are some people who just stay Take the text and this is how it is. No questions asked. Well, life is not that simple. So you have to consider the text, but you have to consider the context. In what context is being said? And what is the purpose being served by it? So there is, there are of course times when we may have to fight a war. When we, this is very important and this is how it should be done. But in the big picture, we have to consider, does this really matter? Is this a battle worth fighting? So what happens for each one of us, uh, whenever there is any emotional stress, it consumes the mind. And once the mind is consumed, it is no longer available for worshipping the Lord. We will see most often conflicts, the first casualty because of our conflicts, is our chanting. As soon as we have some bad relationship, bad bad interactions which give a bad taste in our mouth, then what happens? Our mind becomes hyperactive. And what happens? Even before we see them, our mind tells them off. Maybe a dozen times. And it envisions maybe a dozen scenarios in which we tell them off. In, in, in planning to give others a peace of our mind, we lose our peace of mind. So, um, that's why, for Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Pranada pi suni chena taro rabi karishna amanina manadena kirtanam sadatari. The idea is, be humble than a blade of grass. And this is not that let everybody walk over you. That all right like a tree. The point here is not to let everybody walk over us. The point is to do what it takes so that we can be absorbed in the glorification of the Lord. Kirtaniya Sadatari. If anything distracts us from the glorification of the Lord, then we have to check whether it's really worth the distraction. Sometimes it may be, but most of the times it isn't worth it. So let go. Let go of it. And in the Bible it is said that if you have, if you are worshipping God on the altar, and if you have quarrelled with another fellow human being, you go off the altar, reconcile with that human being, and then go and worship. Because we won't be emotionally available, we won't be emotionally attentive for worshipping the Lord. 
had now of course sometimes it just work that people no matter what we do people just don't listen to us i remember i was at a, at a conflict resolution i was at a mediation just trying to facilitate and then when devotee the approached other devotee i know you are angry with me the other was i am not angry with you i am not angry with you anger is an expensive emotion you are not worth it <laughs> <laughs> and somebody has that kind of attitude what can you do <laughs> it just sometimes you would become so bitter that well in some cases we just have to live with it but at least we can be honest before krishna krishna i tried and but if we hold on to hold on to the resentment hold on to the grudges it's a, i mean the heaviest one of the heaviest things to hold in life is a grudge it is invisible and the burden is not immediately felt but it it is felt in terms of the emotional toll that it takes it drains us so sometimes if the other person is just not reconciling we may just have to live with it but sometimes we just take a few steps down take a humble position okay this is the way you want let's do it this way and in general most people are not bad people in the devotee community especially or even people in general people are not bad it just that sometimes certain attachments overwhelm them there is i'll conclude with this point and then we can have some questions that there is weakness and there is wickedness weakness is where we are temporarily overcome by some impurity in us it can be lust it can be anger it can be greed it can be arrogance it can be envy so so we all have within us some internal defending forces primarily you can say there are two it's our intelligence and our conscience our intelligence rationally tells us do this do this and our conscience you could say emotionally tells us emotionally means when we start doing something wrong our conscience tells us don't do this don't do this when we do something bad our conscience makes us feel bad about it and oh, then i don't want to feel like that so maybe i'll go and apologize maybe i'll go and i'll at least make sure that i don't do this again so this is these two are like our inner guards our intelligence and our conscience our buddhi and our vivek in sanskrit um, so now when we have weakness sometimes the force of the impurity is such that it overwhelms us if we consider the lust anger greed or something like that within us if they normally at this level it's a manageable it's it's sometimes annoying it's irritating but it's the tolerable level but sometimes the graph just surges up just like there are electrical power pulses so like that we may have lust pulses within us when that happens that at that time we might just do something wrong or similar to the anger pulses it might be whatever so at those times we are overpowered and it it can happen to the best of us but what are we doing during the remaining time are we devotedly practicing bhakti are we trying to purify ourselves so if we are doing that in the remaining time then that lapse is a evidence of weakness not wickedness weakness means temporarily our intelligence and conscience are overpowered but soon they come back into action and then we feel bad i shouldn't have done it we apologize and then we strategize okay how can i prevent this from happening again use our intelligence to strategize but in the case of wickedness it's very different is the conscience has been numbed and the intelligence has been subverted subverted means what krishna says in the bhagavad gita that indriyani mano buddhir asya adishtanam uchyate etai vimohayate shu gyanam avrutti dehinam in 340 he says that desire calm desire is situated in the senses the mind and even the intelligence what this means is sometimes some people do wrong 
and then they expertly cover up the wrong receipt. And then, in the case of that, their intelligence is not engaged to stop them from doing wrong. Their intelligence is engaged to stop them from being caught after doing wrong. Once a cop pulled over a person who was speeding, and asked the person, did you see the speed limit? He said, yes, I saw the speed limit. I just didn't see you. <laughs> <laughs> so some people think that doing wrong is not the problem. Getting caught while doing wrong is the problem. So if this is how somebody habituates, at least their intelligence is used not to choose their tracks carefully, but to cover their tracks carefully. And they don't even feel bad on doing bad. It's okay. Everybody does that. What's the big deal? Or sometimes some people, the conscience is so numbed that they actually delight in doing that. Some, some people are sadistic. Normally, if we cause pain to anyone, we will, say, if you're walking through a crowded road and we, our foot steps on somebody's foot. Oh, I'm sorry. You'll have to apologize. But if somebody steps their foot on someone, we notice the other person wincing. And then they raise their foot and bang it down the limit. That's wicked. That's cruel. So, evil is where evil is to deliberately cause pain for the sake of causing pain. Now, when there is wickedness, then we cannot have tolerance over there. There, there has to be there has to be strong action. So, weakness needs to be reciprocated with tolerance and forgiveness. Wickedness needs to be dealt with by with firmness, with justice, with disciplinary action. And in most cases in the devotee community, what we are dealing with is weakness, not wickedness. If somebody had wickedness, why would they even why do they even try to practice bhakti? Why would they even put on a facade of practicing bhakti? Because they want to overcome. Sometimes some conditionings may be so deep rooted that they may themselves given up hope of overcoming those conditions. But that doesn't mean they are wicked. That doesn't mean they delight in those conditions. That doesn't mean necessarily that they, they are not trying to move to Krishna. So I met one devotee in England. He said, after many years, I've developed renunciation. Said, Interesting. This is what happened. He said, I have developed renunciation toward renunciation. <laughs> I stopped trying to renounce them. I just can't do it. So I've given up trying to give up. <laughs> so now, sometimes, sometimes, uh, we, may fighting, we may be fighting our inner battles and we may get defeated so many times that we just lose heart. I can't give up. Now, that quitting is not necessarily wickedness. Although it can degenerate toward that if it grows further and further and further. But the point I'm making is there's a difference between weakness and wickedness. So, Indra... What is he characterized with? Weakness or wickedness? Weakness. Indra is not a demon. Although sometimes he may act in a demoniac way. So, just tolerate that. So, let him do what he wants to do. Uh, Prudhu, you be the adult in the room. So, weakness and wickedness. And when we, when we can resolve this in this, we can, we can deal with issues in this way, we will be able to let go of small things. And so many conflicts can be avoided. We may say that, but every time, why do I have to take the lower position? Why do I have to be the hum humble person? Why can't the other person be the humble person? Each time, why should it always be like a lose-win kind of resolution? Every time you win, I lose. It's not like that. If we are so emotionally invested in something, that we feel that losing is a very bad thing, then maybe there is a time when we need to be assertive. Maybe communicate with that person properly. Not when they are emotionally charged, but at some other time. But overall, if we are focused, if we have something important to do, if we have a service in the Lord's mission, that if we take up responsibility for increasing our own Krishna consciousness and striving to increase the Krishna consciousness of others, then that responsibility itself will consume us so much that the incidental wounds won't hurt us that much. It is, often we, while preaching, we say that the only problem in the world is a lack of Krishna consciousness. 
And then he said, but the problem in my life is this devotee doesn't listen to me. <laughs> if the only problem in the world is a lack of Krishna consciousness, and the problem in my life is also lack of Krishna consciousness. So, now of course I'm not saying that all conflicts can be dealt with simply by tolerance and forgiveness. Sometimes just somehow, so we have, as I said, sometimes we have to live with conflict. Sometimes we have to take assertive action against certain people. But overall, we can decrease the amount of conflicts that we have to face if we can learn to choose our battles. Right. So when I talk about weakness and wickedness, the point I was making is that if we manage that weak, if somebody is exhibiting wickedness, then we have to fight a battle over it. But if it's weakness, then don't worry so much about it. So, and when somebody tried to steal the Juhu land, this time tried to steal the Juhu land from Prabhupada, Prabhupada fought against it. But there were times when devotees, they raised funds and then they maybe were a little careless in how to handle the funds. They spent too much money. In India, especially, it would happen that the devotees would think, they would think in terms of American currency and they thought we got a damn cheap deal. We got a very cheap deal. And the uh, Indian merchants, they would say, this is a damn fool's person. We gave ourselves in the 10 times the price. And sometimes devotees lost a lot of money that time. And that's why eventually when it happened several times, Prabhupada decided, I'll stay in India. This is the reason. So all of you can manage the pitching in America, but you can't manage the pitching in India. So Prabhupada oversaw a lot of the, uh, lot of the projects in India himself. Because he found that his disciples were not able to manage the finances properly. But in that case, he was he was displeased, but he was not. He was not on their case angry. Because that was weakness. That was not wickedness. So all of us, if we choose our battles carefully, and if we take up the battle primarily to be Krishna conscious articles and to strive to help others to become Krishna conscious. If that is the battle we focus on, if we take that responsibility, then all the other scars and wounds that we might get in the inevitable pros in the inevitable pushes and pulls of living together in a community in Kaliyuga, those won't hurt us that much. To the extent we decrease the vigor to share Krishna consciousness with others, to that extent our mind will gain vigor in complaining about things. And the way is we, during our idle time, our mind works over that. So if we learn to take up responsibility, okay, I'm in a situation, this devotee is doing like this, that devotee is doing like that, but what can I do in this situation? What can I do in this situation to make things better? Maybe not with that devotee, but overall, how can I make a positive contribution? Sometimes when they feel that I just can't do anything, I'm People around me are troubling me so much. They are talking. I can't do anything at all. Now, if we feel like that, we can turn around and tell the mind. Let's say, okay. If you are, if you can't do any, if you can't make anything better, can you make anything worse? Well, who wants to make things worse? They are already terrible. I say, no, nobody wants to make things worse. But can we make things worse? No matter how bad a situation we are in, we never lose the power to make things worse. <laughs> I might be fractured and bedridden. I say, I'm powerless, I can't do anything. But I can take a hammer and crack my other leg. And I can make things worse. So if we have the power to make things worse, then we also have the power to make things better. So in our situation, okay, what can I do right? What Not what is right in this particular argument, but what can I do right? How can I pursue Prabhupada's mission? How can I share Krishna consciousness? Maybe small things I can do. And once we start doing that, that brings us positive, that brings us purpose, that brings us higher pleasure. And then, that helps us to see all the incidental conflicts in perspective. And if we can rise above conflicts the way Prithu Maharaj did, we will get in due course reward similar to what Prithu Maharaj got. What was the reward? That for Prithu Maharaj, Vishnu himself came in a sacrifice. 
and blessed him. Uh, Vishnu may not have come if Ruto had completed the hundred sacrifices. But Vishnu came because he was ready to let go of the desire to do hundred sacrifices for a higher cause. Similarly, if we let go of small battles and focus on trying to establish dharma and serve the Lord, the Lord will be pleased with us. And he will, even if he doesn't appear physically in front of us, he will appear more and more in our hearts. And our heart will become enriched and illumined by his supremely attractive presence. And that will give us far greater satisfaction than whatever satisfaction our ego might get by proving ourselves right. So I'll summarize. I spoke today on the theme of <clears throat> how to choose our battles while practicing bhakti that how we can keep small things small and focus on big things. So here clearly we could say that Indra was the wrongdoer and when Brahma says stop the spreading of adharma, Prutu would have taken it to mean that just kill Indra, then this adharma will stop. But he saw it as meaning that don't insist on doing a hundred sacrifice. So he saw behind, beyond the circumstantial motion to what is the overall purpose and he focused on that so for all of us we will inevitably face arguments and conflicts and we may be consumed by the need to prove that i am right but love dedication all these uh, love in one sense means dedication and dedication here means that we our love should free us or raise us above the need about the, our ego's need to prove that we are right. Even if we are right, sometimes there's no need to prove it. Just let go so that we can move on for something bigger in life. It's like a street, somebody instead of getting into a street fight with somebody who's cut us, we go on to an important meeting. So, so by keeping small things small, we can have our energy available to focus on big things. We are meant to extinguish the fires of material existence, but much of our energy goes in extinguishing the fires that we ourselves light. Uh, if we have hard feelings or conflicts with some or anyone, the first casualty of that is our own chanting, because we are no longer we are so emotionally consumed by that conflict that we are no longer emotionally available for the Lord to remember Him, to worship Him, and that's why to do kirtan as a to be absorbed in the mood of glorifying Krishna. It is important that we be uh, humble and tolerant. And this doesn't necessarily mean that we let people walk over us. It just makes sure, it means that we don't we don't get so caught in fighting small battles that we end up losing the war. The forces of illusion can delude us, can bribe us into giving up the fight, but they can also delude us by making us get into a small fight while the big war is being lost. And that small fight is trying to prove I am right. The big war is trying to raise ourselves to Krishna consciousness and raise others to Krishna consciousness. And there, while we tolerate and forgive, there are sometimes to tolerate and let go. There are times when we have to take a stand. So if something is very important for us, it's a, it is the big battle that we are fighting, we may have to take a stand in that. But at that time, those times are relatively few. When do we let go? We differentiate between weakness and wickedness. Somebody occasionally does something wrong because of their conditionings, but they don't have any ill intent. Then don't hold it against them forever. Sometimes in trying to give others a piece of mind, a piece of our mind, we end up losing our own peace of mind. Attachment makes small things seem very big, and we lose perspective. Attachment helps us to see things the way they are and let go of them. And if there is wickedness, then definitely we have to take a strong stand. But in most cases, there is weakness, just let go. And the best way to let go of things is to catch hold of something bigger. So within Krishna consciousness, if we take up the responsibility of enhancing our own Krishna consciousness and doing things to enhance others' Krishna consciousness, then we will find that Letting go will not be that painful. We won't nurse grudges and moods for a long time. We'll just be forgotten in the fulfillment that comes when Krishna enriches our heart. 
the, the stats. Prutu was rewarded for his detachment by Vishnu appearing in the Sri Sacrificial Assembly. So if we also let go of small things, then Krishna will appear in our hearts and enrich our heart. And that satisfaction is far greater than any egoistic satisfaction of doing our sins right. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? If certain conditionings are troubling us and those around us, can we just chant those conditionings away? Or do we need to strive specifically to deal with them? It depends on what the conditioning is, how much it is affecting us, and how our chanting is affecting us. Chanting is affecting that conditioning. It is that sometimes we we don't understand that Krishna consciousness is essentially the process of developing a relationship with Krishna. And a relationship is a complete relationship and involves the whole person. We can't reduce the relationship with Krishna only to chanting. Chanting is a vital uh, extremely potent process for linking with Krishna. But the point is to link with Krishna, to have a personal relationship with Krishna. And if we identify ourselves as servants of Krishna, who want to do service to Krishna, then we will use all possible resources available so that we can serve Krishna better. Let's start with something which is extremely physical. Let's say Arjun, Arjuna, when he was fighting the Kurukshetra war, he was not thinking, let me chant and my enemies will be killed. He had practiced archery diligently throughout his life. And he fought tirelessly. So we could say at the level of physical things, he was dependent on the Lord. But he did not use that dependence as a means to avoid his responsibility of fighting. I will do my best to fight and the results, I depend on the Lord for that. So at, with respect to physical things, we clearly understand that if I am hungry, I'll have to cook food. It is not like a chant Hare Krishna, somebody will mystically provide me food. It might happen one day, but <laughs> it has happened, but you know we cannot base an institution on that assumption. We cannot base our life on that assumption. We have to we have to make arrangements. That's why the Varanashram Dharma, why are there why are there different varanas with different duties? Everybody who is a child education, everybody will be provided for. No, society has to be structured and people have to do their roles within social structure responsibly. So this is with respect to say physical things or physical earning food, physical fighting wars or whatever. Now things become a little more consuming, confusing, not consuming, of course the consuming can be confusing also. <laughs> but things become somewhat more con confusing 
we will come to the psychological level that will chanting help us overcome our conditions so of course there will what do you mean is there a question about it yes it will but how soon so, see we all see that for us maybe some conditioning like some of us might be used to eat meat or maybe drink tea or coffee or whatever and we just chanted for a few weeks or a few days and just give it up so some conditionings fall off so easily and some conditioning just don't fall off they are there for a long long time you know if this is this is say indulgence and this is abstinence for some people from indulgence to abstinence is so easy just give it up but for some people in between there will be like a big mountain to climb because the impressions those conditioning will be very very big for them so one person might just so easily give this up and they struggle and they might think oh am i advancing no you are in a different situation you have to climb up this whole mountain to get here so each one of us have different impressions with us so some devotees might be short tempered and they start practicing bhakti and they just become soft and gentle and some devotees they might be they might be short tempered and even after practicing bhakti for 30 years still they remain short tempered and some devotees they might be gentle and after practicing bhakti they become more judgmental and they become more critical and they become apparently short tempered so what's going on life is complex each one of us is a complex individual and it's we cannot reduce the transformation of heart to a formula let's say the transformation heart are comes by developing a relationship with krishna and just as an ordinary life that if a boy and a girl want to develop a relationship you can't have a formula how to develop a relationship similarly for developing a relationship with krishna we can't have a formula there are general guidelines we are following but each one of us has to do what it takes to develop our relationship with krishna so if we chant more and if it helps it's wonderful so to put this all together the point is it's like we have to do what it takes if chanting extra helps us well and good the chanting has extra doesn't help us that doesn't mean chanting is not working it just means that that particular conditioning is such that we may we may need to do something at an immediate level remembering krishna and loving krishna is the ultimate solution to all problems now whether it is the immediate solution to all problems that will have to depend if i got a, if i fall and i get a fracture chanting hari krishna is it going to remove that fracture well you can say krishna can do anything but that's not the way normally krishna works so saying just as we understand the physical physical reality sometimes it may apply to the mental reality also so if somebody is somehow hooked to something some particular conditioning then they may have to make some specific plans that okay that in this particular situation i am vulnerable so let me keep a distance from the situation or these are my each we all i don't know what are our triggers what triggers us what agitates us so keep a distance from that now that might not be a trigger for someone else and that's why it may not matter for them but if it matters for us then we have with our responsibility to be careful so uh, chanting can also be done in tamoor although chanting is transcendental chanting can become a form of escapism for some people ultimately everything can be used by people for whatever purpose they want so some people may have serious emotional issues to deal with say if they have some very strong argument with someone and they may say that they have to maybe sit down with a mediator and talk with that person and resolve all those emotional issues but instead of doing that they say i just chant hari krishna then they will chant But, and even if they seem to chant intense, those emotional wounds are there, and they do not go away. So we have to do what is meaningful, and so, and we have to look look in this case we have to see fully in a parichaya. Let's say if I if I chant more, is it actually making a difference? If it is not making a difference, then maybe I need to try something else. Maybe I make a strategy and look. Let's do this. Sometimes I may need to have a counselor, a mentor. 
who with whom I sit and talk. It's a war and you cannot say that I am going to fight. We might, we might have a very strong sword and we might be very good at fighting at sword fighting also. But if the enemy is attacking with bows and arrows, you, you will be killed before you can reach the enemy and attack them with the sword. Then you have to pick up the sword and fight. Sorry, you have to pick up the one arrow and fight. So when in, in a war, we can have a plan, but we can't be attached to the plan. We have to be attached to the purpose. The purpose is we have to win the war. So sometimes the plan helps in fulfilling the purpose. Sometimes the plan comes in the way of fulfilling the purpose. So our purpose ultimately is to love Krishna and to become better instruments for Krishna so that he can share love of Krishna in the world. So sometimes the weapon of chanting will help us. Sometimes we may need other weapons. And that's why bhakti is an inclusive process. It's not an exclusive process. Bhakti includes the analytical faculty. Bhakti includes, in the Jiva Goswami, there's so much analysis on the Sandarbhas. Bhakti includes the practical faculty. The Pandavas would practice. They would practice archery. Arjuna was known as a Gudakesha because he would all day learn archery and all night practice archery. So we we can't we need to have an inclusive vision of bhakti, and when we do other things, we shouldn't see that I am giving up bhakti and doing other things. That these are also included in the purpose of bhakti. So if if Arjuna shooting arrows can be included in bhakti, then our making some strategies, taking some guidance from people who are expert in that. Uh, then it, it, it may be necessary. So if we do it, there is nothing wrong in that. We should, it is what is necessary for us to serve Krishna. Does that answer your question? Thank you. So, okay. Yes, ma'am. All the things we do have to come in the nine uh, nine limbs of bhakti. Yes, but these nine limbs of bhakti can also be seen either in a stereotype way or as a dynamic way. So we may say worshipping the Lord. That's one thing. But not over, uh, that's the limb, archanam, or vandanam. No. So vandanam is offering prayers, archanam is worshipping the Lord. So we could say that to worship the Lord, we need to have a deity of the Lord. Maybe to have a deity of the Lord, we need a temple of the Lord. To have a temple of the Lord, we have to build a temple. So now is fundraising for a temple also archanam? Well, yes and no. Yes, in the sense that yes. In an extended sense, it is it is also meant for the worship of the Lord. But no, in the sense that you have to see what is the consciousness. If somebody is becoming constantly money-minded, I mean, as soon as you see a new person, the first thought is, you know, oh, this person is giving an expensive dress. He's giving, he can give me a lot of donations. And then they are very nice and polite with that person. And somebody who wears simple clothes, you know, you just take that dress. If you become that calculative, then that kind of fundraising is... It may not be devotional. So, we don't have to have a, a narrow uh, uh, stereotype vision of the uh, of the nine limbs of bhakti. So, almost everything that we can do, like Prabhupada, tradition, before Prabhupada, nobody used the word Sankirtan for book distribution. I'm going out of Sankirtan. Sankirtan was literally Harina. Sankirtan. But now, when we, we have a Sankirtan stall, well, what is a Sankirtan stall? Is it a stall where you do Sankirtan? No. In the book, book, in the book store where we distribute, we call it a Sankirtan stall. So this is, so the, these words are elastic. They are not unlimitedly elastic. Somebody cannot say, I'll go and watch, I'm going to watch a movie and I'm doing Sankirtan. Well, that's not going to work. <laughs> so they're elastic, but not endlessly elastic. So if some, we are doing something in a mood of service to the Lord, then it is included within the limb of, it, it can be included in the limbs of Bhakti. And I give the example of Sankirtan, the term, the ambit, the semantic ambit of that term 
was extended by, by Prabhupada beyond what was done by the previous Acharyas. So we have to see whether we, we feel connected with Krishna by doing that. I was talking with recently with one, a prominent uh, disciple of Shri Prabhupada or a prominent scientific preacher disciple of Shri Prabhupada. And he was telling me that when I read books on science and spirituality, so I'm not associating with the authors. I'm associating with my spiritual Shri Prabhupada who wanted scientific preaching to go. And I was thinking I'm also interested in science and spirituality. But when I read that kind of books, I don't feel that connection with Prabhupada. That I read those books because I need them for my outreach. I read those books because they give me some intellectual nourishment. But I differentiate. This is not giving me devotional nourishment. For somebody else it might. So we here we'll have to see fully and differentiate. What is the result? Somebody might do fundraising and they might feel devotionally elated. Oh, I want to build a wonderful temple for the Bhagavan. Somebody else might be doing fundraising and they just become so money conscious. Then, okay, if that's the service, do it. But then do some other things also through devotional nourishes. Does that answer your question? So, thank you very much for your attention and participation. And it's wonderful. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to come here and speak to all of you. And Lotus Prashad Radha Hari. Please forgive me if I committed any offenses in the last two days. And I seek your good wishes so that you can continue to serve Shri Prabhupada. Please accept my humble obeisance. Panchala Kalpataram Bhishya, Kapasindhu Bhavacha, Titanam Bhavadibhya, Vaishnavibhya Vinamaha. Katha Chuna Bhagavatam Ki, Shri Prabhupada Ki, Jamanu Ramakta Dandaki, Radho Kundaparinam Bhavacha.